Hello, everyone. This is the three Black Pratt grad photographers. Once again, we're talking to you about photography, and we don't tend to talk about technical issues, but there is something that we are going to be talking about tonight, and that's going to be cameras. And the name of this episode is, What'd You Buy That For? And basically, the question is, what made you purchase the last digital camera that you've purchased Last not meaning the last ever, but the most recent one. And what were some of the aesthetic considerations? Not necessarily the technical considerations, but some of the aesthetic considerations that are specific to that camera, that camera line, that style of camera, or whatever it is that made you decide to buy that particular unit. So the first person that's going to be speaking to you tonight will be Kenneth Nelson, but the second person will also be will not also be, but will be Greg Claghorn, and I'll be the third person. So, Ken, what'd you buy it for? Why'd I buy it for? Okay. Long story. Okay. Oh boy, I'm just going to go. show you two things, okay? Uh, and I got to go through a little bit of history. The, the camera on the Ooh. left is a digital camera, and the camera on the right is a film camera. And one of the primary aesthetics that um, occupy... Uh, my history is uh, the amount of exposures dedicated to a roll of film. Uh, when you shoot a roll of 35 millimeter, uh, lately you've only been uh, allocated 36 exposure rolls. Years ago you were allocated, you, there was available 12 exposure rolls and 24 exposure rolls. But as time went on, those disappeared. And so you were relegated to 36, which meant that your aesthetics were affected, my aesthetics were affected. Basically, there was no, there was hardly any day that I could go out and take 36 exposures, right? So therefore, I had to wait over a couple of days to expose the whole three, three, uh, 36 exposures. Sometimes it would be a week, so therefore the film would be sitting in the camera for a week. Then there would be times when I wouldn't be able to have the film processed to much later. Therefore, that takes up time. Uh, so what I did was, uh, back in 99, I purchased, uh, the camera on the right and the camera on the right is a medium format camera and it ex only exposes 10 exposures. That was one of the primary aesthetic and technical concerns. And I, I know we're not aesthetic technical, but it is an, a, an aesthetic concern because it allows me to slow down and not worry about finishing a roll of film because for the most part, I could finish a roll of film in t of 10 exposures in a very short period of time, within a day, less than a day, where I wasn't able to do that before. The camera on the left is the digital camera that replaced the camera on the right in terms of my shooting when I went digital. And the good thing about digital is that you're not relegated to a roll of film. So you can shoot as much as you want, as little as you want, and no problem. You can come home, offload it, start the next day fresh. The um, aesthetic concerns um, for the two cameras is that they're both wide angle lenses and that is really the key factor for me in terms of aesthetics um years ago when i was photographing i was photographing at a distance and i found my, my most of my images were shot at a moderate distance so there was no emotion connected to whoever i was photographing and i needed to get away from that i needed to get in close and i couldn't get in close with a short lens um, a moderate lens which of 50 which was okay but it wasn't really that close as i wanted to get so um, this is the camera I wound up with after the second camera, and I traded that one in for this one. Not this particular lens, because this particular lens is a 50 millimeter. The lens that I replaced it with was this camera with a 28 millimeter lens, which was basically the same lens, that's on, a similar lens that's on this camera here. Who, and who that allowed me... You said if, there's some, if you don't like the pictures, you're not close enough. Who, who said yeah. that? Yeah. It's uh, Robert Kappa. Yeah. Is that Kappa? So, yeah. So with that, um, my aesthetics became something similar to this. And this is a recent photograph I took back in 2019. And uh, what the camera, what the aesthetics allow me to do is get in close. I'm maybe a meter distance from this person. And as you can see, I'm shooting up. So he's not that tall. It's just that my camera is situated about my navel height. And I'm uh, estimating where his face is going to be as he crosses my path. And then the camera is clicked, the exposure is made, and this is what happens when uh, I get in tight. 
and this is the aesthetics that I go for. The, um, the emotional connection that's tied to being close to someone, uh, whether you are engaged with them or not, you're still feeling their energy. And whatever this person is doing is is also of interest to me because they're, you know, this happens to be rush hour and this person is eating while they're walking. You know, yeah, so you can sort anything. Of, that's so, that's New York yeah, pizza but, right there. But, okay, good. I'll ask my question later. Okay. All right. So that's that lens. And so over the last I'd say six or seven years, my aesthetic has been to always fill the frame, right? as much as I can um, and as get be as close as I can. And uh, 28 millimeter allows me to be close enough um, without having to get um, basically within a, a half a foot of someone. So um, again, this is a 28 um, and this is about 2019 as well. And again, I'm filling the frame. I'm looking for to fill the frame to f um, evoke emotion and to see where uh, or people are reacting to. And the last frame I'll show is this one, which is actually different <laughs> because here we're working in the exact opposite. And what you're looking at is a an expansive scene uh, and it's it's telling a story and it's telling a different kind of story. And you can you're able to tell the same sto uh, different stories with that same lens and get uh, effectiveness effectively you can effectively tell the story uh, with the wide that I've been using. So one single lens that I've used, all three um, images, three different um, ideas, um, three different emotions, but one lens. Right. But also what's going on is you, you have not just the wide lens, but because some of your aspect ratio has changed also to replicate the 35 millimeter frame, mm -hmm. you've got a wider than it is taller frame. And that adds to that sense of depth that you're trying to achieve with 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 how you're working um yeah um it's kind of interesting to to think that way um because i the aspect ratio is not a conscious thought for me the aspect ratio is a byproduct of the lens or of the lens and the camera combined I will always work to fill the frame regardless of the aspect ratio. It could be square. I'll still work to fill the frame. I'll use, um, I'll move in, I'll move back, I'll turn left, I'll turn right, I'll make a vertical instead of horizontal. I'll do that all to consider the aspect ratio of the frame and how it visually appeals to me at the time I'm taking the photograph. And then I'll have a, a basic set of values that I'll be working with as I'm photographing, whether I'll say, is this good enough or is this not good enough for my aesthetical value? And if it's not, I will say, OK, I don't need to take the photograph and I keep moving on. If I think there's something to work within the frame, I will continue to do so if it's stationary. If it's not stationary, I'll either make that decision at the moment that um, the, something is happening, and that will either determine whether I'm successful or not when I take the film back or take the digital Im image back for the edit. So can I ask, what, what, I, got, I got so many thoughts about this, this shot. No, go back to the other one. Okay. What, was, uh, what, was, what were you aiming to capture with this one? Oh, this was um, during the pandemic. Uh, this I'm was aware of that. I knew back, that. Okay, that, this was but... back in March, and this is Times Square. And this is one of the um, first. Well, I, I was going out to Times Square for a while uh, during the pandemic, and um, I just wanted to get the expanse of what it felt like to be in a an extremely crowded neighborhood without the crowds. And it, I, this is one of the spots I think people would be familiar or can deduce that this is this looks like Times Square. I, I think the the item on the upper right hand Looking corner will probably right? give that away, you know. And I think what's happening is um, the there there are certain things that are happening here um, that are indicative and shows the lonesome nature of Times Square without being empty. Okay. Right, you you, you have you have at least that one individual in the in the in the middle and the bottom of the frame that's that's showing you you know a sense of scale and how to you know it's just a lone runner in a canyon. I get it. Yeah, it's it's like a freaking awesome uh, anti Abbey Road picture. I'm like looking for the <laughs> other you know you'd expect in New York 
uh-huh. you know, at least five people in front of her and five people behind her. You know? uh-huh. And, you know, uh, or famous if she was uh, one of the Beatles, maybe she's the unknown Beatles. <laughs> but it was like, you know, the anti Abbey Road image, you know, that that walkway. Very nice. And the and uh, I was like, first thing I thought was big, you know, she's she's playing the piano by herself. Okay, you're you're good. I was thinking it was more like an Amazon ad, like you know, the, where the 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 right turn signal on the upper in the middle right side of the frame. Uh, it, it actually shows not the signal, but the lane painting. Uh-huh. It, remind, it reminded me of the Amazon. So, so it's sort of like you know, uh, you know, what lane. What the hell? Go ahead. Go the ahead. lane. The lane painting that just says uh, uh, only it is specifying that you can only make a right turn. The traffic, the traffic uh, arrow. Yeah. Anyway, it reminded me of Amazon. I was thinking, you know, if you're someone who uh, doesn't like shopping, but you know, but you'd rather exercise and and you'd rather uh, just have your stuff shipped to you. This reminded me of that kind of lifestyle uh, ad that uh, Amazon would run. Gotcha. Okay. I like the Abbey Road idea. Yeah, <laughs> definitely the big, you know, the big <laughs> jumping from left from note to note, you know, and that repetition of black, white, black, white. And it's uh-huh. just, you know, uh, I'm, I'm really enjoying this image, Kenny. Nicely done. I agree. Thank you. That's all I got. And definitely. Folks, unless... I was hoping I would, what I was really hoping that you would do was, is like, uh, uh, like look into uh, some of your other Times Square shots uh-huh. and go back now from like as close to the same point as you shot it and show it now and then put those two together. You yeah. know, the before and after COVID, you know, you could do a whole series on those. Well, I, I'd, like, I, I, I'd like to see- I'd buy the book. I'd like to see how your, because I know you I know you used medium format a long time, yeah. uh, medium format. And I like to see how your 35 millimeter work uh, changed from film 35 millimeter and then back to a 35 millimeter format and how that, part of your aesthetic has changed or is it or is it truly just an accumulative effect and 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 so uh you know what's happened um i i, I like what you capture i, do. I agree the, the, the images that you know i'm i don't even look at the, the frame unless it's you know super wide like that mm-hmm. and the, 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 the framing doesn't even because you fill it like you said you, you work to fill the frame that that that's not something that you just point and shoot you know you have to work to do that and and that and it shows and that's even even when you show like in that one you know you consciously show a negative space by not filling the frame Mm -hmm. and that takes work you know because you gotta wait until there's nobody around i mean it's easier now with covid but right it's it's the secret to this particular one was kind of interesting i'll give you the little secret I was I there were there were two frames that I took of this, one with and one without. The original you know, intent, the, yeah, the the original intent was to do it without a person, and okay. then and then the person showed up and um, was walking running through the frame, and I said, okay, these are options, and you immediately know, okay, good to have options. So let me do oh, this, wait. set it up. And do this, and then out of the corner of my eye, I saw someone out of out of my um, non cam, my non looking eye. I saw someone coming to my, from my left, and I said, "Okay, keep the frame. Okay, just wait until they get into a spot where you're comfortable, and boom, done." So, yeah, options are there, and I think did, I took did, two frames one one without this person before this, and this person uh, afterward. Where you did it pop? Did it did it click for you at all? The Abbey Road thing. You know, yeah, crossing I, mean, that. I have a whole series of crosswalk shots. Okay. 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 And so All Abbey right. Road and people, I think, I think I may even showed it to you. And the interesting thing about it is that I'm quite sure that unconsciously Abbey Road was in the back of my head. Uh, and that was most likely the impetus for the crosswalking shots that I did. The title of the, uh, the, the title of the uh, series is called Crosswalking. And um, cool. I'm quite sure that Abbey Road had some effect on it, if not a major effect. Um, cool. So in a different way. But yeah, I think it's a great um, technique to do. 
um, to use the, the white lines and the receding lines to create uh, dynamics uh, about an image. And, uh, the, and, a, and kind of interesting, the wider the lens is, the more the lines converge. <laughs> yeah, so yeah you got a lot of work to, to make them look good. Yeah, you know, you know. That's all I got, guys. Okay. And that's a lot. You go, Nelson. All right, who's that? I guess I'm up next. Let's see. You are up next. What'd you buy that for? Um, I guess uh, my my biggest thing uh, with the whole digital evolution revolution has been the uh, that that moment when they crossed uh, uh, where digital had better. That was that was the conversation, you know, when digital came out. Well, is it sharper than film? Who cares? What are you shooting? Anyway, but but there was like a threshold in the conversation where digital surpassed film in resolution. And at that point, it started to get fun. And they started coming up with more, you know, it started, I remember, I, yeah, I was shooting back when two megapixels was a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but now, you know, it got up, it started doubling, it was eight megapixels, and 12, and, and big thing. Oh, he's got 16 megapixels, ooh. So at the time, it was probably dated, and I was we were far surpassed this, and maybe my next one. But I promised myself, I got, I got, okay, for this, I got myself a uh, 24 megapixel camera, and I'm thinking, okay. But then I got crazy with it. I mean, I got a lot of, you know, I feel they were good images, but I was not managing them, and I and I made a deal with myself, and I'm like, I'm not buying any more new gear, cameras wise. Until, and I, we got to talk in because I'm thinking about getting a Leica, thinking about jumping ship a little bit. Um, but I said, until I get a handle on uh, effective management of my images, I wasn't going to buy another camera because all I'm going to do is put myself in a deeper hole. So that being said, um, you know, I had some, you know, going into my uh, Photoshop bag of tricks. Uh, long ago, I realized that uh, if I, uh, most cameras shoot, they were shooting in 4-bit for a while, and then they were shooting straight in 8-bit, and uh, I've discovered you can pump it up even higher, you know, and if I took, not if, when I took a, uh, a very a subtle, like a morning, it was like a morning shot, and I shot it, and I didn't bump it up, it didn't do much anything to it, and I got that pixel gradation in the sky where it was like a block of this color then a block of that color then a block and i was like no that's not doing any justice so i went in kicked it up to like 16 bit and it just the smoothness of the gradation of the tonality was just like butter i mean it was it was it was a thing to behold so um, I, I combined that lowered my iso so you know because iso will determine the size and the resolution, you know, that bigger, bigger the ISO, the bigger the grain or noise or whatever. So I combine that with the with the with the large image. Uh, um, oh my goodness, large resolution, which uh, can also affect if you shoot in RAW. I don't know if you guys are really RAW fans, but there's a whole family and whole uh, uh, mindset of shooting RAW. That way, you can make as many. <clears throat> adjustments to an image as you want, yep. um, which is well and good, you know, but I, I like being able to, you know, tweak it up and throw it into, um, you know, a higher resolution or a higher uh, bit count so that I can really, really, really play with your eye, you know, and get in there and, uh, you know, you can get as close as you want and it's still sharp, it's still, got detail it's still got you know all of that visual tangible stuff that that uh makes the eye dance in your head now this image um i really got a kick out of it because it's like uh you know this crusty old tree with the bark and it's weathered it looks like elephant skin and then some goober <laughs> painted a smiley face on it and it kind of mimicked the texture and it kind of it was actually a kind of a throwback to my childhood. It kind of uh, reminded me of those uh, those freaky, scary trees in The Wizard of Oz with with uh, Dorothy. 
and uh, those are the only you know not 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 the uh, Frankenstein. He didn't scare me. Those freaking Wizard of Oz trees. They freaking put a scare in me. I did not like those trees. He snatched the apple back and was like, "Hey, how'd you like me to pull something off of you?" I was, I was pretty creepy. <laughs> anyway, the, I like the idea of getting getting that texture and getting a the resolution enough so that you can bring those textures out at a at an increased format. And uh, uh oh, I'm at thirteen percent. So uh, yeah, yeah. So go on to the next one. As far as resolution goes and such, um, I got another shot like this, but I was going to do this one in black and white also, but I was just, you know, again, um, tickled by the color gradations and the co color variances, you know, even in the cement to the tires, to the tarp, to the, you know, this that strange beige in the building and then the gradation of the sky as it went up. I just get a kick out of, you know, the ability for a high resolution image to articulate all the colors and variances and, um, you know, without much effort, you know, I mean, you can make it as effortless as possible by like what you were saying, work the frame and capture and fill the frame. You know, looking at it, probably just crop out a little bit to the right, just to you know, and get rid of that car, the red car, but. Yeah, I think that's the I think that's the only thing I don't like is the red car. But otherwise, Great, I, think, you. I think you've captured I think you've captured the scene here. Yeah, and um, and then go ahead. You can go on to the next one. And um, so I mean, it's to 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 continue with the uh, with the idea of the resolution. Man, I swear, bizarre things happen. I'm sitting there and I just went out, I was going out to my car and out of nowhere, this green parrot is on my car. I'm looking around like, okay, what, what did I miss? <laughs> then he jumps down and he's, he just starts waddling towards me. I'm like, what the heck? So I sit in the grass and uh, I happen to have my breakfast with me and I shared some bread with him and we just hung out for like 15, 20 minutes. <laughs> So you you broke bread with the parrot. <laughs> with the parrot. Okay. But but I was what I was loving is that you know he was green. He like about five ten shades of green, and he was in the with the grass in the background. And I just could not get enough of all the variations of of the uh, tonalities, and um, I cannot wait. I just shot that uh, last last yesterday morning. Last morning. Yesterday morning, I can't wait to get in, get it into uh, uh, Photoshop, and play with the resolution. Maybe kick it into 16-bit, and really, really, really see every detail of every feather on on this on this young fellow, and get the subtleties and the colors, and and really just have fun with this. He, he was just he just hung out with me. I'm just let me take pictures, and he was choking on the dry bread, so I got him something to drink. It was it was just so funny. It was a great, great, great moment. And so, so he was still there after you left and came back? Yeah. Yeah, he was hanging out. He was hanging out. I mean, you're a great conversationalist, but that's pretty yeah. good to really keep the attention of a parrot. Yeah, we talk parrot. You know, he was telling me about the cats in the neighborhood and, you know, yeah. dating. The dating scene is not good, you know, for green parrots. So, uh, so well, but... But you know, yeah, you know, that's that's it's kind of a navy thing, right? The, <laughs> oh yeah, the parrot. Well, that's more pirate than navy. But yeah, I could understand. <laughs> sure, sure, I could go. Maybe so, so basically, and the parrots live to be about a hundred years old. So basically, it was like, do I know you? You you reminded him of somebody he knew once in the Caribbean. Could be, could be, could be. I I I I don't know. That was just the strangest thing. He just he hopped off of my car. I'm yep. like, where did this bird come? And he just kind of waddled, you know, that that uh, parrot waddle. Mm -hmm. He walked over to me and just kind of was like, looking. He's like, "What's up? You gonna you gonna know, share some of that?" Yeah. <laughs> he's like, "I know you. No tricorn. I, no. I can't make this. No strike up. shirt. No musket. But I know. I know you. Okay. I wish I could make up this, make this kind of stuff up, but it, I, it happened." I, I, I think you've got some really great photographs here that uh, really 
uh, they're they're really nice, you know. They're 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 a lot like the, the you know the whimsy that is yeah. always evident. In everything that you show here, I'm sure you've got other stuff that's you know you know gritty and all the rest of that. But I, I think the the you you make a point to show the the lighter side of life with these photographs. I think that's very commendable. Oh, yeah. Yes. What do you guys think of it? Is that a goofy? I mean, I I just love it. Just fit, you know. I was gonna. I could have gotten away with just. Well, the I, I think you show the. the bar, I think you show but... the joy. You know, the joy of discovering images as you walk around and drive around, and as you travel, you just go, "Wow, look at that! Isn't that cool? I want to share this with people." And that's pretty. That's a. That's a good thing. Yeah. For for me, for this particular image, I'm more intrigued by just the texture of the tree itself. Mm -hmm. I, I'm mm -hmm. so intrigued by text, tree, te, tree texture. Um, and I, from time to time, I just get enthralled by it. So yeah, I find myself uh, looking at the texture of trees and just being, uh, just love it when it, yeah. Okay. My obsession <laughs> is now known. I get you. Okay. I'm done for the day. What's next? Okay. Yeah, those, I, I, those those Wizard of Oz trees were creepy. I'm just letting you know. I, no, no, they were creepy to you, but <laughs> next, next, next to the the flying monkeys. Okay, they were both creepy and they frightened me when I was a kid. I'm still a little traumatized, but I'll be all okay. right. So, Greg, um, the yeah. prevailing word that I would pick from your um, presentation is resolution. Yeah. Uh, yeah, resolution right. was was uh, was important. And that's why I got the higher resolution camera. And then you know I played around with uh, what little tricks I knew in Photoshop, uh -huh. and uh, definitely experimenting with the with the bit count a lot allows you to do sharpness. You pop that bit count up, and your sharpness almost doubles, you know, or uh -huh. triples right away. You know. So and, how does um, that affect what you shoot? Because, well, I'm more conscious. Because, Go ahead. Because are, does that dictate how what you take photographs of in particular, or does it have no effect on what you take photographs of at all? It affects some things I shoot more than others. I mean, I try to shoot everything as sharp as I can, but stuff like that that I'll see, I will try to maximize the, the effect of the texture and when okay. it's all about the texture i will go in and you know get the optimum um because lenses some lenses focus better than others mm -hmm. and uh some lenses are sharper than others and you just try to get the uh to maximize all of the equipment of its capabilities you know you don't go too close because the camera isn't really it's not focusing as tight you don't go too far because you're losing some of that. But you find that range mm -hmm. and uh, fill the frame like you're saying and get it as sharp as you can through mm -hmm. the lens. And then once you pop it into a digital program, we should do one on digital digital programs, man. But uh, once you pop it in, look out because it really if you if you find the right contrast and the right. But I, I think but Photoshop also has in it now, I think, an enhanced resolution uh, setting. So you have to right click and then scroll down. There's like, it'll, you can double the resolution or double sharpness in some way. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. But the, the image also has to be complementary to that. Mm -hmm. There's some Im images that it's, oh, it's sharp. You expect, you know, you expect images in photography to be sharp. But then there's, like you were saying, you know, you try to get uh, an emotional response, you know, out yeah. of the images that you capture. And there's there's a tactile difference when you see something, you know, like elephant skin, you know, or, or that first super close up of an elephant eye, you know, it's a uh -huh. big brown thing. And he's got eyelashes that are like eight inches long, you know, as dangerous as it would be in life you want to touch it you know it's, it's it's almost a reflex thing you know um or grandma skin you know people that photograph oh, no. portraits of grandma <laughs> and their skin is all wrinkly and they've got you know spots and stuff in their faces i would want to touch i want to touch grandma 
<laughs> I know that doesn't sound very. very, very <laughs> you, you have to. You have to. You have Come to here, say Grandma. You. I want to touch you. <laughs> Okay. Or fish skin, you know, scales. They, if you make me one, you don't rub it the wrong way. But it, you know, I got some pictures of some uh, salted fish, and it's just so the texture is just so. You know, I do want to touch it, but uh, I don't have a thing for old people. I'm just letting you know. But I like <laughs> the way that the, you know, the old old people's skin. It, it, when it's photographed properly, it, it's just. It's I, I understand you're you're talking about the character that is evident in the in the in the role tilting image. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. That's 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 absolutely it. Resolution is is big. Uh, I don't know if you've got guys have experience with the uh, with the bit the bit count, but it's fun. And uh, once you you know getting that gradation, that that was my biggest thing because like, I had you know I tend to get you know varying skies and sky can have its own. Uh, character and such but then when you can render it you know because I've, I've seen skies you know painterly skies and then now everybody's shooting in uh uh oh my gosh my brain is fried uh the varying where you can have uh hdr thank you wow mm -hmm. so that you can get the range hold yeah. the sky in its own range and then mm -hmm. bring right. the shadows out in the you know in the foreground or whatever but it changes, it makes the whole image more dramatic. And uh, once you have that kind of control, it starts leaving leaving the realm of just the photograph. And it really starts to get an emotional appeal, you know. And I, I like that quality of, you know, the higher resolution because it allows you to go into the image more and explore and enjoy it more. That's, that's, that's what I'm liking about it. I agree. I agree. Is that all you got, sir? That's it. That's it. Wrapping up okay. with the fork. I'm done. Okay. I guess I'll, I guess I'm up next. Yep. Yep. Ninety percent of my photographic time uh, has been behind the viewfinder of a 35 millimeter style single lens reflex camera, whether it was film based or digital based. What'd you buy and, that for? And it didn't didn't matter. Didn't get there yet. Didn't oh, matter. <laughs> didn't matter whether it was uh, APS dash C or 35 millimeter or even whether the sensor size was either of those. Sometime, maybe about two or three months before the pandemic, I found myself uh, feeling that as much as I love working with 35 millimeter format and a variety of lenses that you can use, I felt that there was something that was missing from what I was doing. Now, this particular photograph, you're going to see three photographs of the same model. Uh, we photographed together several times but I extracted two, three photographs from two photo sessions. This one uh, is a photo session that we did in New Jersey. This is a uh, Miss New Jersey Tourism, I think is the pageant that's on that. Um, on Wait, that I'm looking at palm trees. They got palm trees in New Jersey? Yeah, on the beach, you have to find them, but they're there, it's a long coastline, but I think it's in Point Pleasant, I think. In any event, there are palm trees there. And I think there's more than the two. This was done about, oh gosh, five or six years ago, maybe. And I, I, you know, I thought we did a great job uh, with this photograph. It was a cloudy day. It was almost rainy, but you know, it was, you know, we we got great photos. Mm -hmm. But can you zoom what? out with this image or tilt down or something, Ken? I'm seeing part of the, uh, the, uh, like a. Contact sheet on the left of the frame. Yeah, I can't remove that. That's, okay. that's All right. So nice. if you go to the next image, right, that's a, a, the first frame from a different photo shoot that we did. And you'll find that just like in the first image, I mix ambient light with strobe a lot. 
And sometimes you can tell it's there, sometimes you can't. But in this case, you can certainly tell if you really look. Um, it looks like magic light. That's a very, very well controlled. If that's if that's strobe and natural, that's very well controlled. Bravo. Thank you very much. It's, it, it looks it's, like it looks like a magic light, warm light on her. It's a it's a blend of both. And what I found is that uh, with the systems that I was using, I was limited to the types of uh, shutter speeds I could use and the shutter speed ISO and uh, aperture combinations, you know, the, the three uh, components of exposure. Mm -hmm. And I found myself during the course of a day really fighting with those three components all day in order to get the balance between the background and the foreground all day long. Mm -hmm. And I found that the only way I could sort of uh, change that is if I get into using cameras that have high speed sync and figuring out how that works and getting, but I knew from a long time ago that the best way to be able to work with uh, the, with people, the way I like to work with people uh, would be to have uh, a camera that afforded us a shutter that would sync at multiple speeds. And so what I did was I bought a medium format camera. Uh, it's a Hasselblad. Uh, and I bought that. I haven't had an opportunity to really use it in that capacity because I bought it in the winter before the pandemic. And because the pandemic has been here for over a year, I've used it for photographs of still lifes, for photographs of food. Uh, you know, if you go to my website, you will see it, but uh, you'll see the What's results. Your website name? Put it up on the screen. What is well, the website? the website name is uh, markskinnerphotography.com. You'll see under the still life in the food, you'll see examples of that. A link to Mark's uh, webpage is uh, going to be underneath uh, the video on YouTube. So you can click the link below the video. Okay. Hey, put mine, and up, too. Got, yours, mine up too. Yours uh, is there too, Greg. Yours is you there. Go, oh, okay. All of ours is there. And you can go, you can go to the, the third image. And you can see here where the light was sort of, uh, you know, pushed to the side so that there was uh, so this big bright light that was against the wall, you know, that wouldn't normally be there. And then, you know, it, it, you know, it almost creates another light source when it bounces and, and sort of, uh, you know, uh, rakes across her arm and her figure. And uh, it, it's a really great. Uh, way to work, but it's difficult to do if you don't have the right tools. I also found that with these lenses, the look of my work uh, was not really changing the way I wanted it to change. And I found that um, I wanted to be able to get uh, a more uh, more advertised a look that looks much more like the higher end advertising than I was able to achieve with the uh, 35 millimeter style camera. Now I found with almost immediately that with using one lens and a medium format camera, I was getting the immediacy of the subject in the frame uh, the way I wanted. Mm -hmm. And I was able to get I wanted. And it was just really great. But I haven't had a chance to photograph any models. So what I'd like to do is I'm going to offer, if anyone goes to my website, and they are the first, the third, and the fifth person to say that I am a model or a pageant winner, and I'd like to photograph with you. I will do three photo sessions because I need to use this camera for that purpose. And I'll do them for free. Mm -hmm. There's only uh, two rules that I'm going to tell you here. Rule one, they have to be able to work in New York, either Brooklyn or Manhattan, because I really don't feel like going to the other boroughs. Uh, oh. 
not for this. No, New York, New York, or uh, Brooklyn or Manhattan for this. For this, other things, I'll, I travel. I travel. All, I used to travel all the time. All the time. And then the the second thing is they they had to be with a winner of a uh, and I don't want to say a legitimate pageant, but a a, a pageant that's you know very verifiable, uh, or they have to be someone with a modeling agency that's also very verifiable. And uh, I will trade them uh, for their services uh, the photographs that we get. And uh, that's it. Now, I'm going to probably put this on Facebook as soon as this goes up. But for okay. people who are watching this program, I'd like for you to send them to my through my web page. That's markskinnerphotography.com. Go to the contact. Just fill out the contact form and, and send it uh, that way. But I think the main thing is, is that aesthetically, uh, my work needed to change so i i and these are great pictures i mean you know mm -hmm. they're happy um i'm happy and i think this is really uh you know indicative of the type of work that i do uh but i wanted to just see if i can you know go a little further okay is there what does further look like to you um I think when you, uh, well, for me, is it concrete or is it or is it vague? I mean, is there well, any specifics? It, it, it's or? concrete. It, it's concrete. Me, I, I, you know, I guess the best way to put it would be uh, a certain compression to format ratio that you don't get with the smaller sensor or the smaller piece of film. Okay, you know, with a larger piece of film. Yep. A 150. Let's put let's put it in terms of film. With uh with a view camera, you get a certain type of compression, but you get a certain amount of wide uh field of view with a 150 lens. Yeah. That same 150 lens put on a uh, medium format film camera yeah. uh is a considered a portrait lens. Yeah. And then if you put that on a 35 millimeter film camera, it's a telephoto lens. Yep. Yeah. So because uh, I was afforded an opportunity to work in a commercial studio to get a little bit more compression uh, for the field of view. Uh -huh. um, I wanted to kind of return to that aesthetic a little bit. And uh, I think it would, uh, I think we go back to the first photo, you know, these two, this one and the previous one, you know, they're, they're perfect just the way they are. But I think this one, I think I would have done the, the, the model, even more justice by being able to to get them a little bit uh, larger in the frame, and then being able to to keep all of that extra information, and then maybe even a third tree, um, if possible. Understood. Yep. Yeah. Got it. So, and I, I think I think it's really fine, but you know, it, it just gives you a much more publication quality feel, and I think that um, it, it was something I was hoping to do almost a year and a half ago at this point. Yeah, a year and a half ago. Um, so uh, a little more than that. So my, my contest. Oh, so yeah. you brought you brought that because of this. So right. Yeah, I really I really wanted to, you know, I figured that with the next season that was coming up, which would have been last year, uh -huh. I would uh, you know, have new tools to work with and I would be able to really uh, you know, show uh, even greater capacity, which I have with the food and the and the still life work, but not just that, but also uh, higher quality. Now, Greg talked a lot about resolution, and you know, goes without saying, every medium format camera tends to have better resolution. With the Hasselblad, you get the wonderful color matching. I don't have to uh, uh, fiddle around with different uh, types of color matching. It's just the one. Mm -hmm. uh, which is wonderful because to me that's just like the way film was. You know, you you have that one emulsion with with uh, color transparency, and you know that's it, and you're working with that, and you know maybe it matches uh, from day from month to month. But in all honesty, I always didn't like the fact that with digital cameras there were so many variants. It's wonderful that you can do all that, mm -hmm. but I I didn't like the fact that. Uh, you know, there was, you know, all these different variants in the color because I came from a color darkroom aesthetic where basically there was only one that was the right color. Yeah. You, know, you, you know what I mean? Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. So okay. That's, that's really it.
Yeah. I, I have no questions. I'm, you know, I'm, 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 I'm good. I, I, uh, uh, what, what you created with the, uh, that, that looked like a mixed lighting with the, um, the woman by the, the big granite wall. Mm -hmm. There are certain, certain areas in Midtown and probably now, now, now in Brooklyn, now that they've got a bunch of glass. But there are certain places in um, in uh, Midtown at the right time of day that the light reflection, light bouncing is like all over the place. Do you, I know you know what I'm talking about, Ken? Yeah, I do. Um, uh, hold on, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, excuse me. Um, there are just some places where certain time of day the light is hitting and reflecting and bouncing off different glass and you've got this different I would love to see what a high end camera would do with all of that light. I don't know if you know where those spots are, Mark. Don't think because you're not like a street guy. Well, it changes like actually could, too. It, it change it changes not only with the sun and the right. time of year, yeah. but also it also changes with whatever new high rise is being built yeah. and, it's true. and where the you know I, I mean I know what you're talking about, Greg. You know, it's sort of like wherever there's you know Midtown's being completely transformed. So those those particular uh, shadows may be there for a few months, and then someone else is building a new yeah. uh, you know condominium so that or an office tower, and that particular set of light has changed. Um, I use strobe uh, on location to know what I'm going to get, and that's really the only reason. I used to do all the time in the 80s and 90s. I used to do everything because I didn't have any lights with natural light, and one of the most disappointing aspects of that for me uh, aesthetically was if I photographed uh, underneath the Brooklyn Bridge in April, it was different than it was in October. And there was nothing I could do about it. And I think at the time, I think, uh, you know, they would offer, uh, what do you call it? I think Norman was the only company that made a battery pack or something like that, a 200 watt second. And, uh, you know, and I don't think they had a lot of modifiers for it. I mean, I think, I think it's safe to say we got we're we're all older than the softbox, so it's um it's 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 you know I, I get what you're talking about because I have photographed a lot of that stuff, but I, I really do like the the guarantee of knowing what I'm going to get. Yeah, I mean because I, I'll tell you, uh, 40th uh, Street and Eighth Avenue, um, anytime uh, after. After sunrise, well, nowadays it's really 40th Street and 8th Avenue at about, I'd say, 10 o'clock in the morning. Uh, there's, and I, I have some images on my uh, Instagram page or in one of my videos that I spoke to about this particular type of lighting. Um, but, yeah, but uh, that's one place that I recall that I spoke about, that I mentioned in one of the videos that I talked about. So 40th Street, 8th Avenue, Manhattan. Uh, and this was back in January, so it's changed now. Yeah, I mean, that's what I'm saying. It's like as those, you know, it's not like before. It's funny because, like, when we were younger, I mean, a, a, a scene in New York kind of stayed the same for a while, but it's not like that now. You'd, you'd be amazed at how quickly the the, the city is just changing. It's, it's, it's particularly Manhattan and Brooklyn, Brooklyn and Manhattan. It's yeah. insane. Have you yep. contacted any like uh, ad agencies? I'm sure there's like a gang of new new blood out there looking for new looks, you know, like por portfolio searching or uh, sharing. Uh, or... I, I contacted ad agencies a couple of years ago, and most importantly, I was out of town at the time. Uh, and so yeah, that wasn't a lot of, you know, well, 50 or 60 of them. Uh, but the, mo the most important thing is, I think that I need to get the the work has to level up, and that's just all there is to it. Yeah. I mean, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna kid myself, and and say that uh, you know, at this point, everything that I photograph is uh, going to be the best that they have ever seen. 
So I, I need to level up and compete. How can, how can you even, you, you're knocking yourself down before you even stand up. I, I don't understand well, that. Well, I mean, well, I, I think I'm not knocking myself down. And we've had this conversation offline, but I'll, right, I'll, I'll right, about it here. No, no, no. Not, no, 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 it's okay. No, I mean, well, I just want to say this. From my perspective, if you're going to do anything com uh, commercially, and I can bring it back to film, one of the reasons why we used new cameras is because it was qualitatively better than even 120 or 35 millimeter. Now, you, you talked about resolution. That's concern one. The flexibility of the ability to, uh, to uh, work the image and get the image just as they wanted in camera before Photoshop, the view camera offered more of those tools medium format it's cameras the camera it's what you're shooting true but the camera does offer limitations and it also offers uh, enhancements i mean if you're photographing sports and you need a uh, you know 10 frames per second your finger's not going to go that's 10 that's frames not per that's second. not what i'm talking about it's you don't well, shoot sports you shoot studio well you i've, be I've making photographed them like like you know, everybody can just basically set up a backdrop. You have to make your images. What you capture right. is far more important, far more important than, you know, what you're capturing it with. But that's, true. But let's put it this way. I mean, there are a lot of, no, no, but there's a lot of sports cars, right, that are very good sports cars. Oh God, but you, you can't, you can't cars. use those same sports cars to, to run a Formula One uh, race. Yeah, talking about sports cars. Well, what I, I'm giving you these analogies because there are differences in the cameras. The cameras have different purposes, and I don't really want to get into a technical discussion. But in, in all honesty, uh, you know, you you it, it's difficult at this point in history to use a medium format camera for. Uh, auto racing for something very fast paced, you know, you kind of have to know you're only going to get so many images. You know, if you use a 35 millimeter style camera, you're going to be able to get what as many as 20 frames per second at this point. So you have that many more opportunities to have a successful photograph within one second. Uh, but I'm not photographing that type of subject. And because I'm not photographing that type of subject, I have a little bit more time and I can uh, really slow down and make sure I'm getting what I need to get in camera. And so I think it's one of those things where if you're very satisfied with how you're working, that's fantastic. But if you feel that there's something missing, I think by all means, one should really investigate and see what it is. I mean, there are some people who don't like Photoshop at all. I'm sorry. We we we're losing your audio, Greg. Oh, man, my ear pace went out again. Okay. All right. Anyway, I just want to say anyway, the first, the third, and the fifth, and the reason why I selected those numbers is because I spent years photographing in the 135 format, okay. and I want these three individuals to help me really get the uh, the fashion and pageantry stuff that I wanted to use this camera for really off to a good start. It's a delayed start, but it's my way of saying goodbye to 135, hopefully, and then I can use my medium format camera to get great photos like I usually do, but bigger. Okay. And better. All right. Since we've seemed to have lost Greg's audio, why don't you close it out, Mark? All right. Greg, you still there? I'm here. Okay. I hear you. Okay. No, I okay. All right. Here we go. We are the three Black Pratt grads. And I just wanted to have a conversation about some of the aesthetic choices that people made when they were selecting uh, the latest camera that they purchased, you know, whether it was something about format or whether it was something about the ease of use or whether it was about, uh, you know, um, what it did when it was in the viewfinder or maybe when they got the images back, there was something aesthetically different. In any event, I'm Mark Skinner. I'm here with Greg Claghorn and Kenneth Nelson, and we'll talk to you next time.